Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Grant. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. You can support the show on a one-time basis, support.greatdetectives.net. You can use the Zell app, send a box 13 at greatdetectives.net, or by mail to Adam Graham, Peel Box 15913, Boise, Idaho, 83715. And you can become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters at patreon.greatdetectives.net for as little as $2 per month. Uh, and I do want to go ahead and thank our latest Patreon supporters. Thank you to, and I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly, Darace, and also to Steve. Thank you so much uh, for your support. Both uh, became Patreon supporters at the Shamus level of $4 or more per month. Also over at greatdetectives.net this weekend, every uh, weekend I post a little article or review. Uh, it generally can be related to old-time radio, uh, or it can also classic television or movies, generally with a mystery bent. Uh, it will tie into one of those topics, so it's something you should be interested in. Just check it out over at greatdetectives.net. Uh, but now it's time for today's episode of Dragnet, the original air date, June the 28th, 1955, and the title is The Big Convertible. The story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. <laughs> Detective Sergeant, you're assigned a forgery detail. For the past six weeks, a man has been passing phony payroll checks in your city. You've got a description, but no positive identification. The check forgeries continue. Your job, stop them. It was Tuesday, May 17th. It was windy in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of forgery detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Welsh. My name's Friday. We're on our way back from lunch, and it was 1.13 p.m. when we got to room 29. Forgery. Yes, ma'am, that's right. I see. Hold on a minute, will you please? Hey, Joe. Yeah? Skipper wants to talk to you and Smith. Right, thanks. All right. Well, just one thing, ma'am. Could you tell me what kind of account it is? Yes, ma'am, I understand that. Is it a Come in. Now? Well, in that case, it hasn't got a perfect Hi, Skipper. You want to see it? Yeah, sit down. I guess you know what's on my mind. Oh, well, we got a pretty good idea, yeah. Corner Pocket had me in this morning. Been getting beats from all over town. Factories raising cane because their employees can't cash legitimate payroll checks. Merchants scared to death of being stuck with a phony. You making any headway on this guy? Not much. Well, just where do we stand? Lay it out. Well, he passed another one last Tuesday, a tailor shop on South Jefferson. How many does that make? Well, 24 that we know of. All in the last six weeks? Give or take a couple of days. You sure they're from the same guy? Same M.O., same description. A couple of times he had a woman with him. Said she was his wife. We sent out circulars on them both. Got any results? One or two leads. They didn't pan out. What about your informants? Nothing. They holding out? I don't think so. I don't think they know him. Mm-hmm. Captain Welch. Yeah. Yeah, they're here. Uh-huh. I see. Okay, give me the address. Yeah. Yeah, I got it. Don't worry, I'll tell him. 24 bum checks, huh? That's right, Skipper. That's wrong. Huh? 25 now. On April 6th, we'd received the first report in this series of check forgeries. A grocery store on the corner of Oakwood and 3rd had cashed what appeared to be a payroll check from the Jeffers Connor Aircraft Company. It was marked payable to Russell J. Foreman. In our investigation, Frank and I had learned that the check was fictitious and that the company had never employed anybody by that name. We had also learned that bona fide Jeffers Connor checks were printed in a different manner and in a different color. During the next five weeks, we'd received additional reports of forged payroll checks supposedly issued by various Los Angeles manufacturers. In each case, the suspect had had what seemed to be good identification, either a driver's license or an employment ID card from the company named on the check. The suspect had never used the same name or the same plant twice, but descriptions given by victims had indicated that the forgeries were all the work of one man. 
On three occasions, he'd been accompanied by a woman who had been introduced as his wife. Victims had been unable to make an identification from our mug books. Descriptions of both suspects and their M.O. had been checked by the staff's office and had been sent to CII up in Sacramento. A local and an APB had been gotten out. The 25th victim was Alvin Driscoll, owner of a men's clothing store on South Maryland Avenue. Frank and I interviewed him at his shop. He told us that the forged check which he had cashed appeared to be from the Elderdale Oil Refinery. I come into the store, bought a couple of items, he gave me his payroll check to pay for. That's all there was to it. Uh, that was last Friday? Friday morning, along about 9.30 a.m. What was it he bought, Mr. Driscoll? Sports shirts, that count over there. Marked down to two ninety eight. Some of them were as high as five dollars last year. They're real good buys. I see. Me. Yeah, medium. That, that was his size. Uh -huh. What else can you tell us about this man? How's that? What did he look like? Well, like I said, he takes a medium shirt. That'd make him move. Pretty average. Mm -hmm. About one seventy, I judge. Black hair, a little bit of gray in it. Pleasant face. Ordinary fellow. How was he dressed? Suit, shirt, button down collar. It was a charcoal brown, about the shade of, uh, that one on the rack over there, down at the end. See it? Mm-hmm. When he gave you the check, did you ask for any identification? Well, I didn't have to ask. He just handed it over. He had a whole wallet full. Driver's license, union card, whole wallet full. Hmm. Well, that may have been forged, too. Well, it looked genuine to me. Yes, sir. Wasn't any way of my knowing it was phony. I done just what I was supposed to, everything. Make sure you get identification of your cash check. Mm-hmm. That's what the bank says. It's what you police fellas say, too, isn't it? Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Well, <laughs> I'm still out of $100, ain't I? Looks that way, doesn't it? Mr. Driscoll, is there anything you can tell us about this man? Well, uh, no, no, nothing that comes to mind. Did he have a car? Do you know that? Yeah, I know. Well, did he? Brand new Ford convertible, you know, one of them two-tone models. Probably wasn't even broke in yet, but that sure don't keep him from gunning it when he went barreling out of here. Are you certain about this? About what? Well, that he was driving a new Ford convertible. Well, I guess I know one when I see one. And considering buying a new Ford myself. Not like that snazzy roadster he had, or the sedan, maybe. Had me a demonstration drive a couple of weeks ago. I see. Oh, my. Now I'll probably have to make out of my old clunker another year. Thanks to his bum check. Well, sir, did you happen to notice the license number? On the convertible? Yes. Yes, I noticed it. Well, do you happen to know if it was a California plate or an out-of-state? It's California. Do you remember the number? Now, what do you fellows think I am, anyway? You expect me to memorize a whole string of figures like that when I only seen them once? Huh. I ain't no quiz, kid. Yes, sir. When you're my age, you can't keep every little thing in your head, you know? Yes, sir. Would it really make any difference if you was to have that license number? Well, yes, sir, it might. Then I guess it's a good thing I jotted it down. The victim, Alvin Driscoll, checked his files and showed us a carbon copy of the sales slip for the items which the suspect had purchased. On it, he had noted the license number R1V15347. 3.38 p.m. Frank and I went back to the office and asked DMV to run down the number for us. That's right. 5347. Mm -hmm. Will you call us back? Okay, thanks. It'll be a minute or two, Joe. Mm -hmm. Looks like we might be getting our first break. Yeah. Well, you got a cigarette? Yeah. You all out? Well, I wouldn't be asking if I wasn't. Oh, okay. That doesn't mean anything, Joe. There you go. No, go ahead. Keep them. I got another pack. Well, that's all right. I'll get some more. I told you to keep them, Joe. There's only a couple there. Matter of fact, there's only one. Oh. Thanks, anyway. Marjorie Smith. Wait a minute. Okay, go ahead. Myson? M-Y-S-O-N? I got it. Uh-huh. One, one, seven. Huh? You sure? Okay, thanks. Well? Well, DMV came up with a car to match that plate. Uh-huh. There's one thing wrong. It isn't a brand new Ford. Oh? It's a six-year-old Buick.
The Department of Motor Vehicles had reported that the car bearing license number R1V15347 was registered in the name of Philip B. Meissen at 117 South Helen Avenue. Records showed that the car in question was a Buick sedan, which had been manufactured six years earlier. We ran Meissen's name through R&I. They had nothing on him. We also ran the license number through our auto records to check to see if it was a stolen plate or a hot car. The report was negative. 4.09 p.m., Frank and I drove out to the Helen Avenue address. It was a small one-story bungalow with rain street stucco walls. Police officers. Well? You're Miss Philip Meissen? Yeah. Miss Frank Smith, my name's Friday. All right, your name's Friday, his name's Smith, my name's Meissen. Where's that ghost? We'd like to talk to you for a minute, Miss Meissen. You mean you want to come inside? Well, it might be a little easier to talk there. Nobody's stopping you. Yes, ma'am. You want to sit down, you have to clear off a space. I'm not much of a housekeeper. Sorry, right, we can stand. Suit yourself. Ms. Meissen, is your husband home? Phil? Yes, ma'am. Mm-mm. Do you know where we might get in touch with him? No. You must have some idea. I haven't seen him since last March. Oh, what kind of a car does he drive? Ask him. Did he ever own a Buick sedan? License number R1V15347. Why? We'd like to know where the car is now. It's out in the garage, and that's where it's staying. You can tell that lousy crumb if he thinks he's going to take the car away from me. He's got another think coming. Your husband isn't trying to take your car. Yeah? What are you doing here? We'd like to check the license plate, that's all. You sure that's all you want, just to check the license? That's all. Oh, wait a minute. I'll get you the garage key. Thank you. Sorry if I gave you a rough time. You can't blame me. Character like my husband, he's apt to try anything. Yes, ma'am. Well, here you are. You sure you lock it up when you're done? Yes, ma'am. I'll take a look at it, Joe. Right. Well, I might have known it was too good to last. Ma'am? Not hearing from Phil for over two months. Is he still in Los Angeles, would you know? Not if he's got good sense. What do you mean? If he's smart, he'll stay as far away from me as he can. Yeah. He's just plain lucky I didn't kill him. Giving me a shirt with some other dame's lipstick on the collar, expecting me to wash it out. He should have throttled him with it. Yes, ma'am. Do you have a picture of your husband, Ms. Meissen? Why? We'd like to know what he looks like. Like a bum, that's what. Do you have a picture? Snapshot, maybe. Would you see if you can find one for us? All right. Just looking at him will probably spoil my supper. Yeah, here's something. I'm married to a face like that, and I have to worry about other women. All right, if we borrow this for a couple of days. Do me a favor. Keep it. Joe. Excuse me, Miss Meissen. Yeah. It's the right license plate for wrong car. Buick sedan? Just like BMV had at six years old. Okay. Here's your key, ma'am. You locked up tight? Yes, ma'am. Sorry if we bothered you. Oh, forget it. Hey, wait a minute. Yes? Not that I give a darn, but how about telling me why you're so interested in Phil? It was just a police matter. You don't think he pulled a job or something? Why should we think that? You shouldn't. If you do, you're way off base. You really picked the wrong guy. Yes, ma'am. Take it from me, if a jerk like Phil ever got out of line once, just once, you boys wouldn't have to go looking for him. Oh? No. You'd catch him red-handed. Frank and I left the Meissen home and contacted Alvin Driscoll. He confirmed his description of the suspect's car, but he admitted he might have been mistaken about the license number. We showed him Meissen's photograph, and he was certain that Meissen was not the man who had passed the forged check. The next day, May 18th, we showed the Meissen photo to several of the other victims. They all agreed that he was not the forger. 11.17 a.m., we went over to DMV and began to try variations of the license number Mr. Driscoll had given us to see if we could come up with a late model Ford convertible. 12.32 p.m. How you doing? Well, I turned up a couple of Fords, no convertible. I've switched the last two numbers every way I can think of. What are you working on now? V15. Okay, I'll try the 53 part of it. Wait a minute. Huh? New Ford, only one digit off. Convertible? Yeah. Sounds like it might be it. Huh? It's pretty hard to tell, yeah. What do you mean? Belongs to a car rental agency. <laughs> DMV records showed that a vehicle similar to the one we were looking for was registered to the C.P. Adams Auto Rental Agency on South 6th Street. 2.17 p.m., Frank and I went over there and talked to the owner, Clifford P. Adams. 
Would you give me that number again, please? That's R1 B35347. All right, I got it. Now, if you'll just give me a moment to check our records. Yes, sir. Now, we have a stock of over 50 cards. It's a little difficult to remember all the license numbers. Yes, sir, it would be. Mm-hmm. Here we are. It seems you're quite correct. That's one of our automobiles, a new Ford. Can you tell us what model it is? It's a convertible, yellow and black. Uh-huh. Most of our cars are convertibles. When people come to Southern California, that's what they all want. Yes, sir. Anything else I can do for you? Yeah, is that car rented right now? Well, I couldn't say offhand. Would you like me to find out? If you will, please. Be glad to. Be glad to. It's a different file, that's all. I see. Let's see. All right, this is it. No, no, that car's in the shop today. Grease job, oil change, regular checkup. Do you have the names of the people who've rented it lately? They're right here on the card. Any particular date? How about last week? Thursday. Uh, Thursday. That would be Mr. Waters, Mr. Gerald Waters. He used the car all last week, just turned it back yesterday. Your regular customer? He's rented from us several times, as I recall, on and off during the last month or so. Can you tell us what he looks like? Actually, I've only seen him once or twice. He's a youngish man, about 40, tall, uh, black hair, a little gray at the temples. How about his wife? Did you ever meet her? Yes, yeah, she picked up a car for him. Would you describe her, please? Uh, I think she was blonde. Nice looking, probably in her 30s. That's about all I can remember. Yeah, their address, Mr. Adams. Oh, yes, yes. We try to get all the information we can about our clients, but uh, I'm afraid it's in a different file. All right, take your time. Uh, someday we'll have to work out a more efficient system for all these records. Thompson, Sutter, Virgil, what? Well, yeah, yes, this is it. Uh, home address, Springfield, Illinois. What about here in town? Oh, we have that, too, the Haven House Motel on Sunset Boulevard. I see. But I'm afraid you won't be able to reach them there. Oh? When Mr. Waters turned in the car yesterday, he asked us to drive him and his wife to Union Station. Yeah. Yeah, he said they were leaving town. <laughs> We got a sample of the suspect's handwriting, and we asked Mr. Adams to get in touch with us if he heard from Gerald Waters again. We sent a teletype to Springfield, Illinois, requesting any information they might have about Gerald Waters. The next day, May 19th, the Springfield PD replied that a man answering Waters' description was wanted for a series of Illinois check forgeries. They also said his true name was Fred H. Joyce. They said that they were forwarding a mugshot airmail special delivery. The mug arrived on Friday, May 20th. We showed it to four of the check victims, and they all positively identified the photograph. 3.36 3.36 p.m., Frank and I drove over to the Adams Car Rental Agency to confirm the identification. Hi, Mr. Adams. Well, 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 this is quite a coincidence. Sir? You're coming here today. I just called you a little while ago. We didn't get any message. Well, I didn't leave any message. I wasn't sure it was important. Well, what was it you wanted? About Mr. Waters. You told me to let you know if I heard from him again. That's right. Well, I did. What's that? He wants to rent another car. We showed Mr. Adams the mug shot of Fred Joyce, and he stated positively that Joyce and Gerald Waters were the same man. He also told us that Waters had called the car rental agency about 11 o'clock that morning to make arrangements for renting a new convertible. Joyce had asked them to have the car ready at 5.30, and he said he would pick it up. Frank and I waited in Adams' office, 5.28 p.m. Want to go ahead and answer? Uh, C.P. Adams Car Rentals. Who? Oh, yes, yeah, just a minute. Uh, it's him, Mr. Waters, or whatever his real name is. Find out what he wants. Uh, yes, Mr. Waters. Oh, yes, it's all ready. I thought you were going to pick it up. Oh. Well, I, uh, I, I don't know. Hold on a second. He says he's tied up, but he can't get away. He wants us to deliver the car. Ask him where he's calling from, right? Uh, where are you, Mr. Waters? I say. Well, I don't know. I'm a little shorthanded today. I'll have to check. That phone booth somewhere on Wilshire. Where does he want you to send the car? Uh, where do you want the car delivered, Mr. Waters? Mm-hmm. Crest Plaza. Now, how soon? I guess we could make it by then. All right, Mr. Waters, we'll do our best. Thank you very much. You'll be in the bar at the Crest Plaza Hotel at 6.30, just off the lot. Right, thanks a lot. Oh, uh, about the car, I wouldn't want to damage. Don't worry, Mr. Adams, you don't need to send it. What? We'll take care of his transportation. We went over to the Crest Plaza Hotel. It was 6.28 p.m. when we arrived. There were two entrances to the bar. Frank went in through the lobby, and I used the street door. Yes, sir, what can I do for you? Got any hot coffee? Yeah. Black, please. That all you want? Yeah, that's all. Not very busy tonight, are you? That place livens up later on. All right. Evening. Hi, you two guys together? That's right. He wants coffee, too, huh? Yeah, black. 
Figures. Okay, sports, I'll get it. You see him? No, he's probably not here yet. Mm. Here you are. Thank you. <clears throat> Don't mention it. That'll be 20 cents. All right. There you are. You sure you don't want anything to drink? No. Well, uh, would you mind finishing the coffee over in the booth? What do you mean? Well, it's not good for business. Why? We sell booze, not coffee. Other customers come see you sitting here swilling coffee. It's lovely to give them ideas. A thing like that catches on, the place will go broke. We're police officers. What? Police officers. Well, what are you doing here? Something wrong? A couple of questions we want to ask. Yeah, about what? Take a look at this picture. I'd like you to tell us if you know him. Wait a minute, let me get some light. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I've seen this guy around. Do you live here in the hotel? I don't think so. He comes in once in a while, though. He usually drags a blonde around with him. Mm hmm. You guys been looking for him long? Quite a while, yeah. He must be looking the wrong places. What do you mean? He just walked through the door. That's him. Let's go. How about a dry martini, eh? A couple of them will set pretty good before dinner, huh? Eh? Yeah. Something you want? You, Gerald Waters? What? Gerald Waters, is that you? You from the car lot? You come up with the first answer, mister. How about the name? Yeah, I'm Waters. Where's the car? You won't need it. Police officers, you're under arrest. What are you talking about? You keep out of this, honey. All right, come on, Waters. On your feet. You better take it easy. You're liable to find out you're rousing the wrong guy. Well, I'll tell you, I'm going to run that risk. Get up. Okay, okay. Keep your hands on the table. Oh, sir. I don't know what this is all about, but I know you haven't done anything wrong, Gerald. Whatever happens, I'll stick by you. I'll get a lawyer. I'll raise the money somehow. Whatever happens, I'm never going to leave you, Gerald. Don't worry about it, lady. What? You're coming along. We took the two suspects into custody and drove them down to the city hall. 7.08 p.m. We turned the female suspect over to a policewoman to be searched, and we brought Joyce into the squad room for interrogation. All right, Joyce, take everything out of your pockets. My name's Waters, you know that. We know it's Joyce, too. Go on, empty. Lay the stuff on the table. Where do these keys fit? Lockers. Where? I forget. Sure. Listen, why are you holding my wife? She hasn't done anything. If you think you can frame me, go ahead and try it, but turn her loose. That's not up to us. Why not? She's been with you too often. What do you mean? When you were passing those phony checks. Phony checks? Is that what you think I've done? There are about 25 people who say it was you. They're wrong. That's all dead wrong. They don't think so. Are you willing to go to court? I better shut up. Ever been in Illinois, Joyce? What? Springfield. What do you know about that? You're in the upper brackets, Joyce. We got the whole story. Come on, Joyce. It'll make it easier all around. How about it? Where's Myra? She's all right. Where is she? Right down the hall. I'll tell you what. Yeah? We can get together on this thing. We can come to an agreement. Go ahead. What if I admit the whole deal, tell you all about it? Yeah. What about Myra? Will you let her go? That depends. On what? How clean she is. Well, she'll stand any kind of a look. She's never been in any trouble. Mm -hmm. And she hasn't got anything to worry about. Go ahead with the story. Okay, I'll get on your side. I'm the guy you're looking for. We knew that going in. Whole thing started right after Myra and I were married. Yeah. Making pretty good money, enough to give her the things she wanted. You know, she's a pretty girl. A woman like that's got to have nice things. Mm -hmm. I don't know how it happened. Just all of a sudden, the bottom seemed to drop out of the whole company. You mean your business? Yeah. The whole thing just seemed to explode. No matter what I did, it was wrong. Nothing worked. Mm -hmm. Couldn't let Myra know about it. They just couldn't. Yeah. I tried to borrow the money, talked to all my friends, tried to get them to stake me again. Mm -hmm. All I could see of them was their backs. I had to do something. So you started hanging paper. It was the only way, the only one. Do you have any more checks? Yeah, keys there. They're for a locker downtown. You'll find all the stuff there. Okay. All right, now, how about it? What? Now, you let Myra go. She didn't know anything about it. Not a thing. She didn't have anything to do with it, I swear to you. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to hold her, are you? Now that I've told you the truth. Forgery, Friday. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Where? Okay, thank you. They just checked your wife's prints, Joyce. Why'd they do that? You aren't going to hold her. You gave me your word. You don't want her for anything. A couple of other states do. What? You aren't the only husband she's had, and you aren't the first forger she's worked with either. What kind of a double cross is No this? double cross. She's got a record as long as your arm. That's a lie. A dirty, lousy lie. Oh, take it easy, Joyce. Sit down. Still a lie. Figure it out for yourself. Take a good look. What do you mean? Did your wife know anything about the checks? Sure, after we got going. Wasn't any way to keep it away from her. How about when you started? She know then? No. You sound pretty sure. Maybe you talked it over with her. Uh... I don't know, maybe... She might have helped you out a little then, huh? Maybe some of the operation was her idea. How about it, Joyce? I don't know. I, I don't much care anymore. Maybe it was her idea. Maybe she did play me for a sucker. Sure sounds that way to us. Doesn't really make any difference if she did. 
Take a look around you, cop. Everybody's a sucker. Everybody in the world is going to fall for a con game sooner or later. Everybody. Mm -hmm. Those guys that cash the checks for me. Suckers. Every one of them. Just like me. Look at all the money they're out. Well, there's a big difference. Huh? That's all they're out. The story you've just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On August 17th, trial was held in Department 98, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. <laughs> Frederick R. Joyce, alias Gerald Waters, was tried and convicted of forgery five counts. Forgery is punishable by imprisonment for a period of not less than one, nor more than 14 years on each count. <laughs> just heard Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action, and starring Jack Webb, a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. Welcome back. I have been uh, appreciating the uh, back end of uh, the Dragnet radio series a lot more than the first time we went through it on the uh, Old Time Dragnet show. Uh, I think the first time I went through it, uh, I was comparing it to earlier in the series. And I do think that, as a general rule, the later Dragnet radio episodes uh, were not as good as the early ones. I think particularly, you know, 1949 and, you know, pretty much through most of 1952, uh, there was a really high level of production and a desire to, you know, really be innovative and to put on an amazing show. And they would give you things over radio you didn't hear anywhere else and try and find innovative uh, ways to tell stories, you know, and this, you know, and I think there was a certain hunger to really just excel at the art of radio. Uh, when you get to the end of the series, it, it's a lot more just established and standard, and, uh, you know, if you read uh, up on the time, there was a sense where Jack Webb was you know, ready to move on from Dragnet to other things. When you get into 1954 and 1955, where they had covered already so many different types of cases, and he feels like there's really no nothing more for him to do, and he's ready to move on to other things, but the network is ready to keep paying him a, a big salary uh, to keep doing Dragnet. And for Webb, it made sense just to keep doing Dragnet, uh, but to, you know, start doing side projects and trying to expand his creative horizons while, you know, enjoying all the money that came, you know, with uh, the Dragnet work. And by no means would Webb just totally, you know, mail it in. He always wanted to put out, you know, good quality work. But I think that a lot of the later Dragnets, you know, 
the early ones had a lot more passion and fire for the project going in. But that, all that said, to say that uh, I'm finding if you can just accept them, you know, rather than saying these are not nearly as good as the early episodes, if you can accept the series for what it is, you know, in the mid-50s, this is still a really good program. And there's, uh, I found myself enjoying more and more of these episodes. And I like this one uh pretty well. Some of the, you know, really fun characters. I like the first witness, you know, the guy who, you know, saw the convertible. And he could have just said, well, I don't remember it, but I wrote down the license plate. But first he had to make sure that the officers know how ridiculous it was to expect this elderly guy who didn't have any reason to uh, suspects uh, something with the car to commit that to memory. He's like, I'm not a young man, and I'm not just gonna, you know, remember everything. And I love that he made the point of that, you know, just you know, really grouchy, and just kind of leaves them hanging for just a little bit before telling them, I did write it down. And of course, it turned out that he had written it down incorrectly. So while it wasn't anything groundbreaking they still did manage to come up with a little bit of a new twist on the forgery investigation that makes it stand out from other episodes. So, uh, again, I uh, d definitely am having a growing appreciation for these episodes towards the end, which are still really good, even if they're not quite at the level that the early-era episodes were. All right, well, I do want to go ahead and thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you so much to James. Uh, James has been one of our Patreon supporters since April 2016, currently supporting us at the Shamus level of $4 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support. And I also want to thank all of the people who've become Patreon supporters uh, over the last uh, three months. Uh, we've added a net total of 30 uh, Patreon supporters uh, in March, April, and May, uh, which you know, has put us, you know, well over 200. And so I appreciate just all the people who just come on and support the program. Thank you so much. I uh, truly appreciate that. Uh, join us back here tomorrow. We'll be bringing you public domain video theater and another episode of Man Behind the Badge. And uh, then uh, we'll be back on Monday with uh, Box 13. Tuesday, uh, we'll be presenting uh, a, a previously uncirculated episode of the Casebook of Gregory Hood. And then uh, join us back here next Saturday, another episode of Dragnet. In the meantime, send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.